Well, it's so good to be with you today, and thank you, uh, Star, for that great uh, introduction. I appreciate it so much. Thanks for mentioning HBU. It's true. Uh, Greg is uh, the chairman of our board of trustees and has done such a fabulous job. We are so blessed to have him. In fact, his term uh, originally was supposed to end uh, this October, uh, but the board uh, took a special vote and ex- asked him to stay on for another year as our chair, which has happened very seldom in the history of HBU, but uh, you can imagine why the board wanted to do that, because Greg is such a great uh, uh, leader, and, uh, and of course, his, his wisdom and his pastoral touch during these very challenging days uh, for everyone, uh, and certainly for the university, is much needed. So we're, we are blessed to have, uh, <coughs> to have your pastor, my friend, our friend, uh, Greg Mott as uh, chairman of our, of our board of trustees. Well, it's such a privilege to be able to preach here, and I, I really am, am grateful to, to Pastor Greg for the opportunity to be here and to preach. I do a lot of uh, preaching, but, uh, but not as much lately, particularly the last several months. And uh, so, um, you know, I, I hope I can measure up to, uh, to, to what Greg does. I mean, he is such a great preacher, one of the finest uh, devotionals uh, I have ever heard in my life at a, at a board meeting was uh, was given by Greg, and it's uh, he, he's just amazing, as you know. Sue and I, for the last several months, uh, have been uh, tuning in uh, to Houston's First on on almost every Sunday because uh, we love we love hearing your pastor preach. So that's been such a blessing. You know, Sue has heard Sue's here, and uh, where are you, honey? There, there you are. Uh, so uh, she. Uh, She's heard me preach hundreds, thousands of times probably uh, over the years. We've been, we've been married 50 years, and she started hearing me preach before even we, we got married, and so that's a wonder we got married. Uh, but uh, I, I, I know a little secret. Uh, I can tell you that she's sitting out there right now, since, since I haven't been preaching uh, much at all for the last several months, and she hasn't heard me preach in a long time, she's, she's wondering, you know, if I can still preach. And... Uh, I'm up here wondering if she knows what good preaching is. So, uh, I'm sorry, it's kind of an old joke, uh, but I uh, thought I'd try it. It obviously flopped. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I want us to look together, if you would, with me this morning at Romans chapter 8. This is, um, you know, Romans by, by, by many accounts is, is the most famous book in the New Testament, certainly the most famous of Paul's letters. And Romans chapter 8, I think, and the conclusion, especially to Romans chapter 8, is the most famous passage uh, in the book of Romans. It, it seems to be bringing uh, Paul's argument thus far to a conclusion. He says, for example, where our text starts, although I'll look at several other texts with you, in 831, he says, uh, therefore, what shall we say to these things? So that's, uh, that's a, a kind of rhetorical style to, uh, to say, okay, now what? In light of what's gone before, you know, what, what conclusions uh, can we draw? And, of course, uh, immediately uh, the question arises, well, how far back is he going? If he's drawing a conclusion, uh, how far back does that conclusion go? There are, there are, many, there are many turning points in Romans. It, it, it goes at least as far back uh, as, as 817b, 818. I'll, I'll look at that with you in just a moment, uh, these things. The, these things of suffering, I think, is, is the immediate context that we can see because Paul, uh, strangely enough, begins talking about suffering uh, in 817b. But there have been many great turning points, and, and you can see how Romans 8 and, uh, and this conclusion to Romans 8 as the conclusion uh, has, uh, is, is beginning to conclude all kinds of major turning points in the book of Romans. 1, 1 16 and 17, <coughs> excuse me, 116 and 17 uh, begins by saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so many think that that is the, the thesis uh, verse, uh, uh, statement of the book of Romans. It's certainly a powerful introduction. And then 118 
introduces the whole notion of the wrath of God upon this present evil age. Paul is going to explain more about this in Romans chapter 8, but he says that there is a curse of corruption. We know this from the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled, and a curse was placed upon the garden, upon them, and upon the entire world as they were expelled. But Paul elaborates in Romans 8, Romans 8, 18 and following that there is a curse of corruption upon the entirety of the created order and that the creation groans waiting for its day of liberation that Christians who have the first even though we have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves Paul says in Romans 8 uh, 20 and following so it shouldn't surprise us that uh, he would he would begin uh, after his thesis statement he would begin in 118 by saying the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their ungodliness. For since the creation of the world, his invisible power and his eternal attributes have been clearly seen through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God as God, they did not worship him or give thanks. It's an, it's an indictment, a searing a statement of indictment against the entire created order, uh, men and women who, although made in the image of God and, and have known, uh, should have known from the created order and from God's creative power uh, who God is and give him the worship that he is due, nonetheless made idols for themselves. They took things that were made and, and fashioned them by their own hands into idols and worshiped those idols. And, and Paul says, uh, as all of Scripture says, that the wrath of God, 118, is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And this wrath of God is particularly seen in, in, in that chapter in the, in the perverse behavior uh, that is expressed by human beings. We are murderers, we are adulterers, we are, we are thieves, we are gossips, uh, we commit perverse acts, and the entire created order Uh, particularly human beings, are under this curse. And then he says in a surprising way in chapter 2, and by the way, it's not just those, don't don't think that those of you who know the laws of God and know the way things ought to be are off the hook. Because even though you know these things, oh man, you who practice these things will come under the same judgment, 2, 1, and following. And so he says that basically that the Jew and the Greek are all under condemnation. 2.17 reinforces that point. The Jewish people, the most moral people upon the face of the earth, the, 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 the religious structure that has commandments and has, has, uh, has regulations about, about the will of God and the commandments of God and purity, uh, the Jewish people who worship the one true and living God, the God of all creation, the God who revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush, the God who made the covenants with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the nation Israel. Uh, this very God is, is, is that, that, that even they themselves uh, have rebelled against this God. He says in 2.17, and if you bear the name Jew, let me ask you, you who say you should not steal, do you steal? You who say you should not bear false witness, do you bear false witness? You who say you should not worship idols, do you go into the temples of idols and steal uh, the gold from those idols' temples? The name of God is blasphemed by the Gentiles because of you, Paul says, Romans 2, 17 and following. Finally, he comes in, in, in 3, uh, 1 through 20 to give this, this uh conclusion to this indictment that all the world, not only the pagans, not only the Gentiles, but the Jews as well, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That the entire world has been locked up by scripture, has been made to shut its mouth in the presence of God. All are accountable to God. But then 321 gives us this amazing turning point. But now, Paul says, the mercies of God, the covenant faithfulness of God, the long-awaited day when he would keep his promise to rescue his people that he made beginning with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Israel. But now the covenant righteousness of God has been revealed through the faithfulness, the obedience of Jesus Christ for all Jew and Gentile alike who believe. So all who come to the merciful God through the person of Jesus Christ will experience a forgiveness that is outside the sphere of devotion to the Jewish Torah. It's outside the sphere of of law-keeping or the works of the law, as Paul calls it. 
It is, it, is a, it is a new covenant, a day of restoration. It's the, it's the new creation that has come about because of the death of Jesus on our behalf, because of his sacrificial death, uh, because, of, because of his, his uh, cleansing of us uh, by, by the, the washing uh, that comes from his, from his uh, blood and from his death. Through Jesus, we have received the mercies of God, and that is, that's now available for all who believe. And he tells us that this, this, uh, this powerful redemption, this justification, this entry into covenant with God, this righteousness that comes by faith, it's not just some new doctrine that he's developed. Oh, no, Romans chapter 4, the story of Abraham. Uh, Abraham tells us, that we, we, we learn there, that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And then in Romans chapter 5, he's starting to draw everything to a conclusion. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we've obtained our access by, by, by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice. Here's the note of triumph. Romans 5, he's starting the conclusion. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also rejoice in our afflictions, in our tribulations. He introduces this strange note. Tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God, he introduces the idea of trouble and faith and the spirit and love. The love of God has been, has been um, shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. For one would scarcely die for a righteous man, though perhaps a hero. Uh, for a good man, one would dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, enemies, ungodly, alienated from him, while we were yet sinners, the Messiah, Christ, died for us. Therefore, we have now, he says, Romans uh, 5, verses 9, 10, and 11, we have now been justified. That's a very strange, it, it's, it's so typical for us because we're, we're so familiar with it, but that's actually, in, in, in sort of Jewish theology, that's a very strange thing because justification, that's the declaration of innocence that's going to take place on the last day. There's a, there's a great courtroom, and God is the judge of all the earth, and the whole earth will stand before him, and he will separate, as Jesus said, the sheep from the goats, or as the, or as, uh, the prophets say, the, there'll be a valley of dry bones, and he will make his people to, to rise up, but he will bring the nations to account. And he'll set the accounts in order and he'll, 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 he'll put things right again. On the last day, God will declare either guilty or innocent. But Paul makes this remarkable statement that now we have heard the verdict of the last day already. Already we have been declared innocent in Christ. Christ has been vindicated. That's what the resurrection is. If you allow me to use this, Paul actually uses this expression one time uh, in his correspondence with Timothy. He says, he says that Christ was justified. You say, well, he's not a sinner. No, but justified means vindicated. He was crucified and vindicated. He was raised from the dead. He really was the Son of God, and they were, they were foolish in the powers of darkness. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 were, were absolutely fooled. They would, had, they, had they known uh, that he was the, the Son of God predestined through the cross for our glory, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They were caught in a terrible trap. It was the plan of God that his Son would die on our behalf. And so this, 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 amazing, this amazing truth has taken place that the, the death of Jesus brings about already in him just as he was vindicated and justified. So all those who are in Christ, we are justified. Our innocence has already been declared prior to the judgment of the last day. God has said in all who are in Christ are as he was vindicated, vindicated justified, or as he goes on to say in Romans 5, 11, even now we have received the reconciliation. The judgment of the last day has been declared. And then Paul starts talking, he wants to summarize, he goes all the way back to Adam. And then he follows another potential uh, uh, line of thought. Does this mean that now that we've been forgiven already, 
in Justified Already that we can sin more that grace may abound, chapter 6. Or in chapter 7, what's the purpose of the law? Is the law therefore sin? Oh no, the law is holy, righteous, and good. Then why, Paul, do you say that we're no longer under the law? And he deals with that whole question in Romans chapter 7. But he comes in 724, Romans 724, to say, so who will, even though I know what I'm supposed to do, I can't do it, and and the power is not within me to do it. I, I know what's right, but I can't do what's right. Who will liberate me from this body of death? And then chapter 8 begins the great conclusion, resumes the conclusion that he started in chapter 5. There's therefore now, the word now is a big word uh, in Romans. Now we have received the justification. Now we have uh, received the reconciliation. There's therefore now no verdict of condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life, the resurrecting spirit of life, has liberated you from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was operating through the sinful flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering, there has been a condemnation, but he condemned sin in the fleshly body of Jesus. Through the death of Jesus, the powers of sin have been conquered. He did so in order that the requirement of the law, the demands of the law, can now be met in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then Paul begins to describe in Romans 1, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 8, uh, 4, through, uh, 4 through 17a, he describes the Christian life as, as the power of the Spirit helping us to put to death the deeds of of the old creation, the old order, the power of the Spirit working within us, the Spirit guiding us, the Spirit bearing witness with our spirits that we are children of God, the Spirit enabling us to cry out, Abba, Father. We may know that the God who will stand before us on the last day is our Father who loves us through Christ and who will extend his mercies, has already extended his mercies to us. And so Paul says in in, uh, Romans uh, 8, 17, and so The Spirit uh, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children of God, then we are heirs of God. We're in the will. We have a future. Fellow heirs with Christ. He's been vindicated. We'll be vindicated. And then Paul makes, introduces this, goes back to that strange topic of tribulation. Since indeed we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. Christ suffered and though it was not expected that when the Messiah would come the age of suffering would continue. Messiah has come. The resurrection has begun but it's not yet finished. The age of suffering continues. And so Paul from this point in Romans uh, 8 17b 8 18 all the way to the to the end of the chapter 8 to uh, uh, 8 39 uh, tells us of how nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Spirit prays for us. The Spirit enables us. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. God is taking all these things of suffering, the curse that's on the created order. He's taking all these things and working them together for good for those who love God and are the called according to his purposes. So that brings us now back, 831. So what should we say to these things? What are the final conclusions to draw? I can't tell you the the name or even when, or I won't uh, be able to, uh, but but I want you to, I want you to hear a conversation I had with a very thoughtful man um, under under the sentence of death. He was dying, raised in the church, a um, thoughtful um, worshiper. And um, so I was talking to him, and, and I said, how are you doing? Because there was no secret that he was dying. And he said, well, I'm dying. And I said, I know. Uh, tell me about it. What, is it. what does it make you think about? And uh, he said, and this, this may make you uncomfortable to hear, and I apologize for that, but this is an honest answer. It's every bit as honest as Paul was when he 
when he talked of the, spoke of the sufferings of this present evil age. Or in 2 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 8, when Paul, only a few months before, a few months before, had written to the Corinthians, he said, I would not have you ignorant, fellow Christians, about the affliction which came to me in Asia, that I was burdened excessively beyond my strength so that I despaired of life. That's Paul talking about his own time of despair. And we, we, we live in times of despair. We, we live in times that uh, where, where, where the isolation, the illness, the, the threat of death. Let me tell you, suffering brings fear. It is, it, is, it is part of the human experience that when we suffer, we wonder, is this ever going to be over? What's going to happen? What's the future hold? People are isolated. They feel fear. I heard just I heard two um, um, middle-aged uh, women talking uh, just a few days ago, and I caught just a snatch of the conversation. And one of them said, "Not being able to go to the nursing home to visit a friend is terrible. Oh, that's bad." And we've had the same experience in our family that that you've no doubt had over the last few months. Funerals are deaths where you can't go into the hospital to visit a dying loved one. Funerals that can't be easily planned or attended. Isolation, fear, suicide rates uh, are going up. Depression is going up. Undiagnosed illnesses are going up because of the attention given to the COVID virus. Necessary attention. 200,000 Americans over uh, have died from that. Businesses have been shut down. Civil unrest. That's been the, the tinderbox that has made a lot of this unrest uh, very powerful. Have you ever seen such political, social polarization in all your life? I haven't. I'm sure it's been here before, going back to the Civil War. But we live in some very, very troubling times. And so that man was honest. His, his words of honesty were, he said, I'm afraid. And I said, well, you know, tell me about it. He said, I, I know in my head what the scriptures teach about the resurrection. He said, but I'm afraid. I'll just tell you the truth. I'm afraid. He said, I keep having two images. One of them, one of them is there's this ladder. And I'm climbing this ladder step by step. And it just stretches up. And I keep climbing. And finally, it disappears into a dark haze. He said, I'm afraid of nothingness. He said, now I know that if I die and there's nothing, I won't know that there's nothing. He said, but if there's nothing, I just tell you, he said, I'm afraid of it right now. He said, I feel claustrophobic. And then he, he said, and then this other picture I have is there's an abyss right in front of me. It's dark and it's bottomless. And he said, and I keep throwing a rope, trying to let the rope connect to the other side and the rope won't hit or wrap around anything. And I, I can't get across. So we, without going into the discussion here, I, I did my best to remind him of what the scriptures teach, which he'd been taught all his life. That in the story of Jesus, it's not us climbing to God that, that Christ himself has come down for our salvation. He has come to us. That, that, that the energy of God from the other side of the abyss has come across to connect with us. That the resurrection of Jesus, that, that salvation is, is, not, is not by the, the greatest of human efforts by technology, by, by health, by science, by human effort. But it's a new creation. That the resurrection of Jesus is God's energy coming from the other side of the abyss to us. And that the resurrection of Jesus was publicly witnessed. And we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And then I said, and then as we talked on, he said, well, let me tell you my other fear. And... He said, and that is, he said, I know this is contradictory, but if there is something and not nothing, I'm afraid because of my sins. He said, I'm, I'm ashamed of the way I lived my life as a young person. And I'm ashamed of a lot of things I've done as an adult. 
And he said, I, I, I know the story of forgiveness. He said, but I, it's just hard for me to get over sometime when I know what I've done. Romans 8, 31 and following talks about these two great themes. The power of God that breaks through the isolation and the separation and the mercy of God that's greater than our guilt or shame. Listen to Romans 8, 31 and following. This is a courtroom. This is the last day. What should we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? This is the disposition of the Father. He has acted on our behalf. And this, uh, this phrase, for us, it, it's, it's hard to translate. It's for us, and it usually means for us having acted for us in our place to our benefit. It goes on to explain that. How, did God, how, how do we know God is for us? Because of what he did in the death of Jesus he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? This is an argument from, in a sense, the greater to the lesser. If God would do this, is there, is there any? If he would go to this extent, is there any sin in your life that can finally separate you from this God of mercy? There's an echo of a biblical story here. He who did not spare his own son. If you, if you recall the story of Genesis 22, it's the story of Abraham and Isaac. And Abraham takes his, his boy Isaac and, and, and he, he has heard uh, the instruction to take the boy and, and, and sacrifice him. His son, his only son. And so it's a very poignant story as they're, they're climbing uh, the mountain together. And Isaac says, Father, where's the, you know, where's the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham is grieved, but Abraham takes the boy and he binds him to the altar. And at the last moment, the angel of the Lord stays his hand and stops him and says, Don't harm the lad. Now I know that you trust me. It was a test for Abraham, a gruesome, horrible, terrible test, but it was a test. And Abraham passed the test. And Abraham's son, Isaac, was spared that word spared comes right out of the story. Now I know that you would not spare your only son. Listen to this. But the father who did not spare his only son, at the last moment before they nailed him to the cross or before they began to beat him or plant the crown of thorns in his head, he did not spare him and save him with legions of angels as he could have done. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And now the courtroom scene continues. Now it is the loving father who is the judge in this case. The father who has already declared in Romans chapter 5 our justification, that we are innocent. Now it's a question of, a, of, of God, the father, the loving judge who will pass... Uh, who will make all the determinations in this case, indeed has already made the determination. And then there's a, a prosecuting attorney. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? In Scripture, you typically think of Satan as the great accuser, and that's certainly applicable here. But also sometimes in Scripture, uh, we, we read that, uh, for example, Jesus says in, in Matthew in Matthew 12, that the men of Nineveh will rise up against this generation and say, we repented at the preaching of Jonah, and, and you haven't repented at the, at the preaching of Jesus and the, and the apostles who preached the coming of the kingdom of God. Or the queen of the south came to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and, and yet you've been able to hear the wisdom of the everlasting Son of God, and you've rejected him. So there are people who will rise up on the last day to speak against, uh, against uh, those uh, who've not repented. Or sometimes in Scripture, our sins cry out from the ground. You know, the blood of righteous Abel cried out from the ground. But who will dare? We're not told who the, who the prosecuting attorney is. But who would dare bring a charge against God's elect? The answer is no one. God is the one who has, and you can, based on Romans 5, 
it has already declared us innocent. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who would dare to condemn God's people? Our sins are real. Our sins of heart and mind and body and action and omission are real. But our sins are not greater than the power of the living God through Jesus to cleanse us, love us, forgive us. We have found our mercies through the God who did not spare his only son. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus. And then there's another person who shows up in this final courtroom scene. There is an advocate. Christ Jesus, Messiah, King Jesus, who died. There are four clauses here. Who died. Oh, rather, who was raised. He's been vindicated. He is there in this courtroom scene at the right hand of God. He is the one who intercedes on our behalf. And then the question of power. Is there something that can isolate us? Is there a power that will fully separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? All these troubles of this cursed world, all the sins of this cursed world, all the tumults and turmoils, the poverty, the war, the rioting, the distress, the alienation, the isolation. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation or distress or persecution or plague or poverty, or danger, or sword. It's true, Paul says, as the psalmist in Psalm 44 said, Lord, we're like sheep who are being slaughtered for your sake. You're letting it happen. We, we, the psalmist in 44 says, Lord, we were innocent. We didn't stretch out our hands to a pagan God. And yet, Lord, for your sake, we're being considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Somehow this, this is all in your hands and in your purpose. But then Paul says, but in all these things, that these things of suffering, of poverty, of war, of protest, of rioting, of injustice, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Christ has been vindicated, and we are in Christ. We overwhelmingly conquer. Then Paul concludes, all these angelic powers that stir up these troubles in the world, Paul says, I am persuaded, I know that neither death, death is the final enemy to be defeated. You could almost capitalize all of these because in Jewish angelology, uh, these are terms for angels, spirits in the invisible world. Death, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. None of these powers are strong enough to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. God has jumped the gap through Christ. The everlasting Son of God has come down for our salvation. The Father has sent His Son to us to die for us, and the Son has willingly laid down His life on our behalf. The Father vindicated Him in all those who trust Him. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are children of God. The Spirit reminds us that we are God's children. We cry out, Abba, Father. Can you look to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and say, Father, through Jesus, save me? The good news is, he has already declared you innocent and his child in Christ. Lord, we pray that we would be found faithful before you. Lord, we love you. We extend ourselves to you. Lord, we confess our sins. We we have done so much that we should rightly be ashamed of. And yet we have found, we confess your mercies through Jesus. Please rescue us, save us, heal us. And then, Lord, empower us by your Spirit not to stay isolated, but to do by prayer, by generosity, by faithfulness, by service, 
to do your work in the world. Lord, we want to be your people. Use us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.